Morning, students. I'm here to talk to you about video games. Though they've been with us for a very short period of time, they've grown into an over $25 billion industry that has influenced the lives of millions. Today, I'd like to take you on a trip through the history of this young, exciting, and often chaotic field. Part of the reason computer games haven't been with us that long is the need for specialized hardware to run them. This is a modern recreation of Tennis for Two, often held to be the first video game as it had a visual output. It used an oscilloscope to display a tennis ball bouncing back and forth across the net. It was written by William Higginbotham in 1958 to entertain children visiting Brookhaven National Labs. The version pictured here is a recreation created for the 50th anniversary of that lab. In the same year, one of the most pivotal inventions of our time, the integrated circuit, was created by Jack Kilby of Great Bend, Kansas, one of the two men to independently invent the technology that allowed us to miniaturize electronics and heralded the birth of the microcomputer. This is Space War, probably the best known of the earliest computer games. It was written by Stephen Russell in 1962 when he was a student at MIT. Space War is a space combat simulator where players control two ships and try to destroy their opponent and avoid getting pulled into a star at the center of the screen. This is Stephen Russell in the PDP-1, the computer he originally wrote Space War for. Though not very powerful, the PDP is roughly equivalent to a modern pocket calculator, though the calculator has more memory. The PDP-1 and its descendants play an important role in the early days of computer games. At that point, computers were very expensive. $120,000 for a basic machine, that's 920000 when adjusted for inflation. As a result, most aspiring game developers were college students at universities, and there was no commercial intent behind their games. They were purely for fun, intended to be copied and distributed to other universities with similar systems. It was through this work that another video game pioneer came to develop an interest in game programming. Nolan Bushnell studied electronic engineering at the University of Utah, and he also worked for Lagoon Amusement Park where he managed the Midway games. He realized that a coin-operated machine was an ideal way to commercialize video games, as the expense of building the machine could be spread over several thousand customers. His first attempt at an arcade machine was Computer Space. Developed by Bushnell and his partner Ted Dabney and released in 1971, it was only a moderately successful. However, it did serve to crystallize the potential of computer arcade game for Bushnell and Dabney, who went on to found Atari in 1972. Among their first products was the arcade game Pong, developed by Nolan Bushnell and Al Alcorn. During the development phase, they installed a prototype at a local bar, Andy Capps Tavern, where it proved immensely popular. A few days after the installation, the bar manager called Atari because the machine had quit working. So many quarters had been fed into it that they had jammed the mechanism and actually unplugged one of the circuit boards. Also in 1972, Magnavox released the first video game console, the Odyssey. It was designed by Ralph Baer when he worked for the defense contractor Sanders Associates and licensed to Magnavox and sold through their stores, alongside television sets. This marks the beginning of the first generation of game consoles. A more advanced Odyssey would be released in 1975, alongside a home version of Pong. Two new companies entered the fray as well. Colloquio, once known as Connecticut Leather Company, which had moved from leather craft kits into molded plastic, and from there into video games and Cabbage Patch dolls. Also, this marked Nintendo's entry into the market. Nintendo is a Japanese company that had to start in hand-painted Hanafuda playing cards. When he took over the family business, Hiroshi Yashumi experimented with many other lines of the business, taxi services, hotels and restaurants, as well as the fledgling video game and arcade industries, which proved his greatest success. The second generation of game consoles was a great step forward. Unlike the first consoles, which had a fixed number of games they could play that were built into the hardware, this generation introduced cartridges containing actual memory chips that could be run on an 8-bit multiprocessor within the console itself. This generation is also notable for its number of entrants. In 1976, Nolan Bushnell sold Atari to Time Warner, and the property quickly became the most profitable branch of the company. Over the next few years, Nolan Bushnell, who'd continued to run Atari, would clash with Time Warner management over the direction Atari should go culminating his leaving the company in December 1978. As part of the separation agreement, Nolan agreed not to make video games and instead turned his attention to the Chuck E. Cheese franchise, which he also helped to start. The sheer number of game consoles on the market made it difficult for consumers and retailers to understand the differences between the machines. Additionally, each console had its own game library written both by the console manufacturers and third-party developers, both with little quality control. 
Retailers, unable to judge the quality of video games, often discounted all cartridges, leaving smaller and smaller profits for the developers and little incentive to make really good games. Compounding this issue, many companies, including Atari and Mattel, had company policies that forbid programmers from receiving credit for the games they produced. Warren Robinette is credited with creating the first Easter egg, hidden content in a game, in order to credit himself with the creation of Atari's adventure. A number of the most talented Atari game programmers, frustrated with this lack of recognition, left to found Activision. As an illustrator of the challenges involved in developing cartridge games was the Atari game E.T., a licensed game based on the Steven Spielberg film. Negotiations for the rights took so long that when they had been secured, there was only five and a half weeks development window to finish the game and have it ready for the Christmas shopping season. Nonetheless, Atari anticipated success and manufactured a massive but undisclosed number of cartridges. Game industry legend has it that millions of unsold cartridges were buried in a New Mexico landfill. This was coupled with another highly anticipated Atari game flopping, a port of the popular arcade game Pac-Man. These disasters, along with declining game sales, led Atari to declaring bankruptcy in the early 80s. Atari's troubles were symptomatic of a larger issue, and in 1983 the bottom fell out of the video game market. Many other game companies also went bankrupt, and consumer confidence in games reached an all-time low. Retailers got rid of their video game stock and vowed never to touch them again. While things were looking bleak for the video game consoles, this was not the case for the other two wings of the computer games industry. The period from 1978, the release of Space Invaders, until the late 1980s, is often referred to as the golden age of arcade video games. Arcade machines could be far more expensive than home consoles for the exact reasons Nolan Bushnell realized with the release of Pong. Accordingly, these machines could push the envelope in computing power in ways that home consoles couldn't. Coupled with the rampant mall culture of the 80s, arcades became popular social hangouts as well as profitable businesses. Nintendo cut their teeth, development teeth in the arcade business, and it was through developing arcade games that the artist Shigeru Miyamoto came to game design, developing the immensely popular Donkey Kong. Miyamoto would go on to create some of the best known and loved video games and the video game characters of all time, including Mario, Zelda, and Donkey Kong series of games. ARPANET, the forerunner to the modern internet, came online in the 1970s, connecting research labs and universities across the United States. Computer games developed at one university could quickly spread across the young network. One of the earliest and most influential games to do so was Colossal Cave Adventure, often shortened to Adventure, originally developed by Will Crowther. A caver, Crowther had developed a text-based adventure based on Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. The game was revised by Stanford graduate students Don Woods, and many other versions were created for, by further authors. This text-based game was so influential that it lent its name to the entire genre of games, the adventure game. The first adventure game with graphics, Mystery House, was developed by the wife-husband team of Roberta and Ken Williams. Roberta was inspired by her experience playing Colossal Cave Adventure over a teletype terminal in her home. The game was designed by Roberta and programmed by Ken on an Apple IIe, and they self-published it as a home business that grew into the company Sierra Online, where Roberta developed some of the most popular examples of the adventure game genre. This was possible because while the console market was dying, home computers built on the same microprocessor technology were booming. Many video game developers switched their efforts to developing for the immensely popular Commodore 64 and other computer platforms. Many of these computers were available as kits you could assemble, like the Texas Instruments TI-99 pictured here. The Timex Sinclair 1000 is also worthy of a special note. Manufactured in the economically depressed city of Dundee, Scotland, many machines fell off the backs of trucks and were available in the black market for prices children could afford. As a result, Dundee was responsible for some of the most talented game developers to emerge in the late 80s and 90s, including Peter Molyneux, the creator of games like Lemmings and Fable, as well as founder of Lionhead Studios. Nintendo followed on the footsteps of its first video game system with the Famicom, Family Computer, which was a great commercial success in Japan. Nintendo very much wanted to expand into the U.S. market and engaged in negotiations with Atari to distribute the system in 1983. However, the collapse of the U.S. console market prevented the deal. Undaunted, Nintendo moved forward with their plans. Recognizing the cause of this collapse was largely a market flooded with poor quality games, 
Nintendo developed its seal of quality that all officially licensed games would carry. These games also had to go through an arduous quality assurance process, and the rejected games could not be published. The Famicom itself underwent a makeover, reinvented as an entertainment system, whose appearance set it apart from earlier game consoles and included accessories like the robotic toy Rob. Finally, the NES contained a handshake chip that would only allow authenticated cartridges to play, heading cut down on counterfeit games. But even with all their efforts, U.S. retailers were wary of anything even resembling a video game console. Nintendo of America responded by piloting the NES in New York in October of 1985. Their typical strategy would be to rent a mall kiosk directly outside of a toy store, set up a demonstration machines, and sell consoles and games on the spot. When the toy store managers saw the flood of sales that they were making, a distribution agreement would nearly always be forthcoming. This effort was expanded to the cities of Los Angeles, Chicago, and San Francisco, and went national by the end of 1986. Nintendo brought new life to the console market in the United States and was soon joined by two other competitors, the Sega Master System and the Atari 7800. This also set the pattern for generations of game consoles to come. The market would support about three consoles, one of which was typically the clear market leader, and console manufacturers would forever after enact strict quality assurance measures to keep the quality of games manufactured for their systems high. Nintendo had experimented with portable gaming with its Game & Watch series, a wristwatch that doubled as a simple game, but with the Game Boy it blew open a new market. Sega was quick to match the Game Boy with their own Game Gear. From this point on, there would generally be two portable consoles on the market. In 1990, Nintendo released one of the most popular and highest selling video games of all time, Super Mario Bros. 3. It was also one of the most anticipated games of the time, and was featured in the movie The Wizard. Video games had established themselves as cultural icons. Also featured in The Wizard was the Mattel Power Glove. It was an early attempt at creating a motion-based control system. However, it was plagued with poor performance. The fourth generation brought a shift to 16-bit processors, and also demonstrated that backwards compatibility wasn't necessary for success, bucking the trend that Atari had begun with successive generations of their machines. The explosive rise in the popularity of games during this period, coupled with the perception of video games as being for kids, that was reinforced by game advertising and the development of increasingly realistic graphics, brought scrutiny to the field. Games like Night Trap and Mortal Kombat raised questions about the depictions of sex and violence in video games, and the Senate convened a series of hearings to consider censorship. The games industry responded by forming an independent ratings board, the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, ESRB. While earlier computer games had experimented with wireframe 3D perspectives, id Software began pushing the envelope with Wolfenstein 3D in 1992 and Doom in 1993 and further sequels. To run on the existing generation of computer hardware, lead programmer John Carmack had to develop incredibly efficient rendering algorithms, descending down into assembly code to write much of the processing. This in turn led to the development of 3D accelerated graphics cards in the mid-90s hardware that streamlined the rendering of a truly three-dimensional scene. This hardware is so ubiquitous today that every modern PC and smartphone is a descendant of this technology built in. This also marks a turning point in the games industry, as to create more realistic 3D games required larger and larger development teams and spending more money per game. The fifth generation of consoles followed the trend in computers, and 3D hardware was a big part of the new consoles. This generation also saw a new entrant into the market electronics giant Sony. Nintendo and Sony were collaborating on a CD-ROM add-on for the Super Nintendo, and when that deal fell apart, Sony decided to redirect the project into a standalone console. The sixth generation featured f far more refined 3D graphics systems. This generation also marked the end of a legacy as Sega bowed out of the console game markets shortly after releasing the Dreamcast, and turned their attention to developing games for their once rival Nintendo. Sony secured their place in the console market with an extremely popular PlayStation 2, which doubled as a DVD player and was backwards compatible with PlayStation 1 games. And software giant Microsoft entered the fray with the Xbox, in a dream of a unified living room experience that they have been chasing ever since. Released in 2003, the iToy is an expo important experiment into an alternative control schemes. Basically a webcam, Sony posed the question, can you control a game with a series of pictures? And more importantly, open the door for considering other, less common ways to control video games. The debut of smartphones offered, offered another platform for portal gaming and development and heralded the rise in casual gaming. 
By the seventh generation, the contenders were in place. Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo each had an offering. Sony brought a new, powerful cell arch architecture to the table. But the need to radically change the way video games were programmed to take full advantage of it meant that many games failed to utilize it to its fullest. And while relatively weak in computing power, the Nintendo Wii brought a new mode of interaction to the console, motion-based controls. Sony and Microsoft eventually developed their own motion control schemes, the PlayStation Move and the Microsoft Connect. The hectic and costly five-year pace of new console releases finally came to a halt with this generation, whose seven-year stretch allowed the console manufacturers more time to recover development costs. With the global demand for smartphones, new processors and the open-source Android operating system presented a new opportunity for micro-consoles, less expensive and highly portable devices. Ouya was launched by Kickstarter in 2013 and raised over $85 million, and the game stick followed soon after. Fortunately, these consoles did not fare well, with the game stick shutting down after only two years, and Ouya officially closing its online store on June 25, 2019. The eighth generation marked a move away from specialized hardware to regular PC components. Nintendo continued experimenting with interaction modes and the Wii U, offering a combined small and large screen experience. And Valve tested the console market waters with a licensed Steam Machine custom PC that would run as Steam OS. Nintendo broached the ninth generation and continued the visionary efforts with a new console that brought together portable and traditional console play, the Switch, in 2017. Microsoft and Sony's ninth generation of console entries are launching soon. That brings us to the present day. I hope that you have enjoyed this trip through memory lane. <laughs>